Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see uh, so many people who are interested in this topic. Uh, so uh, we have some other uh, co-presenters that should be here in a moment. Uh, so in the meantime, you should see on your screen and also do take a, some time to download the uh, handout. So uh, the handout is a copy of the presentation notebook and there is a link to uh, what I think is a really cool application of large language models to uh, education, which is being able to do Q&A in a way that wasn't possible before in large classrooms. So while I'm just giving people a minute, again, go ahead and download that handout notebook. Uh, also go ahead and if you would like, fill out that uh, Q&A so that we can show the sorts of things that you can do with an LLM. Also your, your questions and if you have them concerns will be added to a list of others that we've, we've done a similar demonstration in other talks that uh, we've done here. So um, this, this will be an interesting collection of questions and things that then we can use. So uh, at any rate, um, let me also show the sorts of things that we'll do here after people get a chance to use your questions. So again, because large language models have slightly different results sometimes, let me go ahead and show. So this is uh, an automatically generated notebook here. So what you're seeing here is something that reflects questions and answers. So these are before yours were added. We'll just give people a chance to go ahead and add them in. But let's say that you have a class of I don't know, 200 undergraduates who are taking some large physics course or something, right? Well, previously, you know, uh, you would not be able to, as a person, go through and actually look at all those 200 questions right there at the end of the lecture live. You might see a couple that are at the top and answer those, but then you're going to have to then, before the next day, look and see, okay, what are the, the overall themes and patterns that are emerging from these questions from 200 people that then I can go ahead and, and talk about at the beginning of the next day's lecture. Well, okay, that's good and fine, and, and technology has let us do that for a while. But if you're wanting to go ahead and look at what are the emergent problems now at the end of the lecture, while well, the questions are fresh in students' minds, and I can be most helpful to them, uh, you can actually just feed them into something like a large language model so that then they're able to come up with what are these emergent themes. So uh, th this question bank, I think, is uh, about 40 questions that people have that uh, were uh, you know, related to this, this, how is AI, but specifically large language models and things like chat GPT going to affect education? Well, if you take a look at these themes that have emerged, um, these are, I think, very good themes, right? So in, in this particular case, uh, the large language model did a pretty good job of actually getting the questions and extracting themes from them and then picking exemplars to represent those. So we'll come back to these and I'll run this again near the end so that we can see what sort of questions you all have. Uh, and again, don't be shy about putting things into the uh, Q&A here so that people can, can take a look at that. But uh, let's go ahead and switch back to the main part of the presentation and carry on with that. Okay, so uh, so the, the couple of things that I'm going to talk about here, one are teaching with LLMs and the sorts of new things that this allows, and the other thing is teaching about LLMs. And then after hitting on those two topics, just touching on computational thinking more broadly, right? So uh, if, if we for a moment put ourselves into the situation of a teacher who, let's say, is not familiar with code. So if you're at the Wolfram Technology Conference, there's a solid chance that you've written some Wolfram language code before in your life, right? But one of the things that you might be interested to do, and this particular example I should mention, uh, I've also shown as part of a Wolfram U uh, webinar that we did. So if you're interested in uh, more student use cases and some additional teaching use cases uh, for you know chat enabled notebooks and those sorts of things uh, do take a look at that webinar it's linked at the bottom of this presentation notebook but i really wanted to, to hit a different message for this audience with an example like this one so uh, again if you've downloaded the presentation notebook you can follow this link and so i will briefly switch over to show the um notebook that I'm talking about, but if we, if we, then we look at, okay, so what is the actual input that an instructor is needed to put in, in order to create a lesson that uses code, right? So using 
something like a large language model in one of these chat enabled notebooks, you can go through the process of, again, creating a handout that you would give to your students. So when I taught this lesson, uh, this was before large language models were sort of in the mainstream. And so I had to by hand create my handout and I had to you know, provide the students with code that I had written. That was fine. But let's say that you're an instructor who has not had any experience ever writing code before, but you still want to incorporate this into your curriculum. You want to be able to use these, these new tools to be able to help you add computation to the classroom in a way that you don't have to understand every single detail that's going on. So again, the main point I wanted to make with this is that all of the code that's in this example here is written by the LLM, right? So the instructor is helping the large language model refine some of the logic that's going into the uh, explanations that might answer that let's say students are gonna be asking questions. So the instructor is probably going to want to sit down and see, okay, if I ask common student questions that I'm anticipating, what are the sorts of responses I'm going to get back? Are they pretty good in general, or is this a domain where you need a little bit more sophisticated prompting to get the most out of the model? Again, if you're an instructor who's going to be using these sorts of tools, that's a good thing to get some idea of ahead of time so that you anticipate the sort of things that your students are going to be bringing into the classroom. So again, the, the reason why I, I really like showing this example is because all of the code is not written by a human in this example, which is, uh, you know, potentially exactly what an instructor who is not familiar with code is looking for. So again, if you're here at the Wolfram Technology Conference, probably that's not going to be your main concern, right? You're probably pretty comfortable with code if you're here. But it, it is worth keeping in mind that there are lots of instructors out there who have had absolutely no training in being able to write code. And so even you know jumping into a language where it's relatively uh, straightforward to learn because there's super functions and pretty readable syntax, these sorts of things, that might still be a, a barrier to them. And so it, you know really important to, to note that when you're looking at co-design of you want to come up with new lesson materials that incorporate things like computational tools, by leaning into the ability of these models to help write code and help explain code, this is potentially an, an entry point for instructors to be able to jump into this area. So uh, again, a point that I want to really make because I, I think it is the key thing when it comes to this. In, in fact, in our uh, networking session for educators that, that we had this morning, uh, someone correctly brought up the point that really a, a lot of the questions about how much this technology will be adopted uh, into classrooms has to do with education policy. So for example, is your campus just as a blanket statement saying, no, you can't use chat GPT or things like it, or is it a campus where uh, maybe you're encouraged to explore ways of, of teaching and, and using these things? So for most of the presentation, I'm going to assume the, the viewpoint that you're in a context where the, the policy allows you to adopt these sorts of tools if you want to. But that is another question that, again, people who, who care about education, which everyone in this, this session certainly does because you're here, but education policy is really a, a key question about how this is going to actually shape education going forward. Because we can you know, show all sorts of interesting things about what the technology can do, but when it, when it comes down to, all right, how are students going to use it, that policy piece is really, really important. So again, I, I like to uh, point people to prompt problems, which are an interesting uh, paradigm for assessing, right? So this is a variation on a prompt problem. Uh, they, they have a slightly different take on them in the original paper that proposed them. But basically the idea with a prompt problem is that it allows you a new way to assess, right? So if you can take a problem and from the top down describe it in such a way that a large language model is able to produce a solution, then that's a certain amount of work on the part of the student. We'll see some other examples later on uh, that get into various prompting techniques and things that you and students should probably be aware of where uh, you know, the models might do pretty well in some domains even without any real thought to how you're prompting them. However, for more complicated problems, even something uh, you know, that you might learn, let's say in a, in a, a first year uh, physics class. So this is something that when I first started learning physics, we came into it knowing the mathematical language to be able to express equations like this. However, we weren't going to learn how to solve those equations until maybe a semester or two semesters after when we were first wanting to be introduced to them as a useful tool for modeling the world, right? So if you're teaching in a context like this, you might have 
uh, you know, this new question, okay, well, is it a valid assessment if I am having a student solve all their homework problems using a large language model? Well, this concept of a prompt problem is basically set up to try to answer that question affirmatively and saying that, that yes, actually, if you can describe the solution method in sufficient detail, that a large language model can actually execute on the you know, instructions that you're providing it, then you, you as the student have put in a certain amount of mental work in figuring out how can you describe what the problem is, and then you've broken it down into steps so that something can attack it. Now, that was already part of exactly what we wanted students to be learning well before large language models entered the conversation, right? If we have a student who's learning problem solving, that initial strategizing step is something that's been a part of the curriculum guides for years and years and years is something that we really want to target that students are learning. And so something like a prompt problem where the student can describe exactly what you want them to do, uh, excuse me, exactly what they want the model to do, and then the model can produce some output that sure enough executes on the student's vision and gets them uh, a nice plot, which is what they were wanting to show. So in this case, they're uh, so if, if we think about what are the, the larger things that the student is doing, right? So again, part of the secret sauce to a prompt problem, at least in the way that they're so far been conceptualized, is that the actual task is not exactly described in quite the same level of detail that you would if the student was gonna be the one doing the calculation. Because if the student's the one doing the calculation, that you really don't want the student to say, oh, well, I misunderstood what the question even was. In some of these prompt problems, you can rely on a little bit more of that background context, right? So if you'll notice in, in this uh, little variation on one, we're just presenting the student with a situation and two models. And these mathematical models, the student then is the one who's saying, oh, so I want to label this one because it didn't use the small angle approximation in this particular domain. Here, this one, uh, excuse me, this one did use the approximation, this one didn't use the approximation. And then a useful thing to do if I'm considering alternate models is to actually compare them. And so how can I do that? And the student has gone and said, this is what we want to do to compare them. And the model writes all the code to do it. And so if you're, uh, you know, oh, so here's the, uh, the raw model. I should probably turn this into, yeah, let me turn this back into the, uh, persona, which is the uh, code assistant. So again, if you're new to chat enabled notebooks, something important to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, you, you might want to use different personas for different different tasks, right? So let me go ahead and uh, turn it back to the code writing assistant, because it will probably do a better job. And so if we, we take a look here, we see that uh, this is not exactly the same, but it's broadly the same as what steps were taken before. Right, so it's writing down equations, solving them, and then saying, okay, let's plot the difference, which is exactly what the student asked for. So again, the whole idea behind this new way to assess is that the student is focusing on the strategic, what should be done rather than the tactics of how do I do it and how do I calculate it? And so what I think is interesting is that this has been something which has been highlighted previously by educators as something which sometimes gets lost in the shuffle of the ways that we often assess, right? So much of our assessment focuses on, do you understand the tactics necessary to do various calculations or to produce various, let's say, um, writing outputs if, if it's a different class, right? But, you know, strategically, this is a very important thing to be able to articulate. So by letting the large language model actually execute on the strategy that the student is giving, it's really isolating that strategic element. So um, again, the things that this has in common with the previous example, which was co-designing something with a large language model, is that the human provides an initial idea and then provide, provides instructions to refine their output, right? So if you were to, let's say, uh, not give specific instructions about what functions to use here, you were to leave out some reminders to the model, uh, it will definitely get those sorts of things wrong at a slightly higher rate than if you provide the more specific instructions, right? So again, just guiding it in the right direction of what to do as part of the prompting is something that the students can get used to doing and is an actual learning goal that you might want to include as part of some uh, you know, units that you design, keeping the fact that large language models exist in line uh, with the design. So uh, you know, the other thing that the student does is they introduce the key concepts. Right. 
So if a student is using a large language model, but they're the one that's telling the model when this particular concept is relevant, then you know that that's actually coming from the student. And you can even have them maybe, let's say, write a reflection afterward where they've produced some output using a, a language model. So let's say that you know step one of this assessment that you're designing is that you present the student with some situations. They describe the strategy of what would be a nice thing to do given those situations. They get some outputs. And then as an additional layer of uh, metacognitive development that they can do, you can then say, all right, so given this output, so the model wrote some code. Let me go back to the one that uh, we actually ran here to get that other one. So the model wrote some code and it did this part, you did this part. As part of your reflection on this process, tell me which ideas did you have to contribute? Why did you contribute them? Did the model use them, right? Those are questions that are relevant to the problem solving process, whether or not you're using a large language model. This idea of after you're done with some kind of project reflecting on the process, this has already been something that's been the toolkit, again, of educators for a very long time as a way to take something that you're doing and then try to build metacognitive skills on top of it, because that metacognition is really key to students being successful lifelong learners. Okay, so uh, again, the, the key point for if you're teaching using large language models is that there's some key ingredients that are what you want the human inputs to be. So you, if you're already on board with this idea that you're going to uh, not do uh, the approach of never using these, right? So, so if, if the policy is such that you can actually use large language models as part of making curriculum, then these are the key inputs that we really want people to still have when they're uh, as students interacting with this technology, right? So they're providing ideas and questions. They're the ones that are refining details and helping the models to have better instructions so that they can give you better outputs. They're the ones that are introducing the key concepts. So again, in the example seen, uh, uh, in the, the previous two ones that I'm, I'm one reason I'm not going to dwell on those too long unless you have more questions is that um, these are examples that I have shown before as part of another webinar. But uh, the no, knowing when a concept is relevant is something that you can actually see as part of the history of the student's interaction with this, this large language model. And seeing where they introduce the key concepts is now something that becomes something that you can look at as part of the perhaps new way of assessing what's the student actually doing as far as work going into this process. Uh, the other thing that, that you might do, right? So in the sciences, we tend to be very focused sometimes on, you know, to do the calculation and then there's much more to science, but many of our assessments are doing the calculation. In other areas, uh, let's say English or history writing, critique and correcting uh, something that you've produced before has been part of the way that they assess for a very long time. Well, now, no matter the domain, large language models are really good at coming up with lots of things that you can critique and figure out, did they do a good job? And so, you know, no longer are you just limited to doing peer evaluation of uh, students evaluating other students' work. You can have this sort of neutral production of content where, you know, it could be the instructor, it could be students is instructing the models to make all this content that are relevant to what, whatever the learning goals are in a particular uh, area. And then the students get to look at that and say, is this a good job or not a good job? And they get to, let's say maybe they would have been shy if they were critiquing their friend's work, but this is just a large language model. You can critique away and its feelings won't be hurt, right? So they can really actually show what are their critical skills. Uh, and then also them knowing how to extend what a, a model has done, right? So let's say that a student has gotten this far. Well, you know, there's some obvious questions now of, you know, is, is there a period here in terms of uh, how the difference between these things grow? Or uh, is this just going to, you know, have this oscillation, but then have some trend where the, the waveform, uh, you know, grows and grows and grows, right? So, you know, if the student can look at what's, been done so far, and they're the ones that are framing these new directions to explore, again, that's them being able to say, all right, given a situation and what I know, here are some questions to explore. And that's really what we've been trying to get students to do forever. And so now if it's easier for them to do that, great. <laughs> um, so uh, let, let me also reiterate some other advice on assessment, right? So uh, again, this is something that uh, I've said before, but is really, really worth saying uh, because it, it's highly supported by much education literature over a very long time. So 
every assessment really needs criteria for evaluation, right? So if the assessment was, was it right or not, that probably wasn't a specific enough criteria for a large scale project. That's fine if you're doing what's called a formative assessment where you're just wanting to see is some atomic skill being followed along the way. But if it's right or not, is the you know results of uh, you know some giant project that you've done for a client in the workplace, right? Well, okay, is it right or not is a relevant question, but it's not the only question, right? So the same should generally be true of the large project-based assessments that you might want to do with students. So uh, given the large language model's ability to solve certain kinds of problems, we might now have new reason to go toward things like project-based assessment, which I've already been a fan of for a long time, uh, and to make sure that we're actually aligning our assessment and their criteria that we're using to evaluate them and then providing feedback to students in such a way that the uh, student is still benefiting from it and they're not just having the large language model answer the question of, is this right or not? You know, that that's, again, fine for some atomic task that you want to check, you know, does the student know their arithmetic table? But, you know, that if that's the only thing that their, their learning is building toward, I can tell you that they will very quickly become disengaged, right? We need these actual real projects that students can, can bite onto and say, yeah, I care about doing that. And that provides motivation for learning the atomic skills that something like, you know, ChatGPT or Wolfram Alpha would be very good at, right? So, uh you know, as a, as a fun thing I like to do, so far it's always agreed with me, right? So again, in the presentation materials, I keep one where, uh, you know, it, it said yes, but let's run this again and let's see, you know, d does this uh, large language model actually agree that these are backed up from whatever it knows uh, about assessment and education literature? Uh, yeah, okay, so according to the model, uh, right. but. Now, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, especially with this group, because the teaching with LLMs question is a very interesting and critical question. But there's also this, this question about teaching about LLMs. So this is a technology that uh, really broke into the mainstream in a big way uh, not very long ago. And one of the unfortunate things about it is that a lot of the parts of the story of how it works were basically missing from what you might call the general curriculum for a very long time. Right. Uh, so now we have this question of, OK, well, we've got this new, highly relevant piece of technology. And I, I should say this is a question which has come up before. Right. Just about having computers in general, uh, when computers in general, you know, entered public life in a big way, people had these questions about how can we teach about these things, given that they're new and given that maybe some of the background into understanding their theoretical underpinnings is not something that most students are going to learn. So this exact same question now exists surrounding LLMs, right? And, and arguably, uh, they're going to have a, a more immediate impact than something like the in introduction of the computer did. You know, the computer obviously is something that enables us to even have large language models in the first place. But in terms of, you know, not being something that the public was paying that much attention to, and now suddenly being something the public is paying a lot of attention to, uh, we, we've got this problem to solve of, okay, how, how can I teach about LLMs given that most of the requisite background knowledge, which again, we know as educators, requisite background knowledge is one of the key ingredients to making sure that people learn things, right? You have to be able to introduce new concepts that are just beyond, but still connected to concepts that the students understand and know. So where can we even start in, in terms of getting into these sort of things? So uh, this part that I wanted to talk about with this audience is a little bit more speculative, but um, hopefully provides some, some good uh, discussion points and things that, that people can uh, find inspiration from in going into and you know, actually encouraging people who are in policy positions to incorporate some of these ideas into the curriculum, but also being able to uh, you know, create the sort of curricula that people are going to need to be able to teach about these things. So, uh, all right, so we have this question about where does the story start? Well. You know, you, you could go all the way back uh, to uh, vision networks, right? So, I mean, even though this isn't a large language model at all, it still illustrates some of the key concepts that we're going to want students to understand when we're teaching about large language models. So some of these concepts are that, you know, what are these networks? Well, there are a bunch of layers that are connected in various ways. If you, if you look at this, this classic Lynette vision network, it's connected in a particularly simple way. So, uh, you know, this is, this is one concept that we might want to 
have students understand is that these are these layers that pass data along from layer to layer. How they work is that there's a monstrous amount of matrix multiplication going on, plus some secret sauce in the nonlinearities that you introduce. And so, you know, you can see from a simple network maybe that, all right, so there's a bunch of matrix multiplication. I can see, yeah, this is not a straight line. And then we do a bunch more matrix multiplication, we get some output. So that that basic story, if you boil it down to be that simply, is what neural networks are doing. And so another concept is, well, uh, you know, e even though large language models are a very new technology, we've had classification networks for a very long time. And so this, you know, simple image classification network, if you run it on the, the, the training set that it's famous for, you can see that, uh, excuse me, the, the test set that it's famous for, uh, you can see that, that sure enough, it, it gets some of the examples wrong, right? So this is another important concept is that, you know, the, these particular tools are, are absolutely not, uh, you know, foolproof, right? That uh, what they actually do is they predict probabilities. And so just by having this really simple example, and you can even go so far as to say, well, what, what is it actually doing to, to get these probabilities? I mean, th this model's sense of vision is nothing like what you or I probably are imagining that we're doing when we're identifying this is the number three. Uh, you know, there's some, there's some way more strange thing here where we're projecting to some high dimensional vector space. And so uh, as we'll see here in a minute, th this gives us again an opportunity where we can bring real applied concepts. Uh, I have a friend who works in the uh, uh, game development industry and he tells me that anytime I'm in front of an audience that's talking about education, I should encourage all of them to tell every student they ever run into that matrix multiplication is relevant for computer graphics, right? Uh, it's also relevant for this, for this technology incidentally, which is why I bring it up. But when students are learning matrix multiplication, most of them have no idea that that's the real application because a lot of the curriculum is not designed in such a way that it makes the application salient. And so again, if, if you can have technologies that are very real and relevant to people now that illustrate why thinking about high dimensional vector spaces are something that anyone would care about, this is a great way to bring that into the mathematics curriculum, let's say. So uh, again, you can also apply this to other domains, right? So you could like bring these sorts of ideas into uh, history classes, right? So you could create classifiers with a single line of code and then take a look at well, what does this classifier predict about the Titanic disaster? And so, I mean, this then having a graphic like this that a student could actually create uh, is something that the, uh, the course in history could use as a jumping off point for then talking about, well, okay, well, why was the chart like this? Why isn't it some other way, right? Uh, so th this is the first this point I wanted to make is that, you know, we, we could just generally spend a lot more effort talking about neural networks and the sorts of things that go into those. So then there's some LLM concepts that are also relevant for students, right? So this is probably not news to anyone here, so I'll breeze through this part. Um, but, you know, again, we could take models and see what they do. They uh, predict next likely tokens. There's this whole idea of tokenization and temperature. So again, the, the idea that LLMs are not really thinking in terms of words is something that might not be obvious to a student. And so if we're trying to build the curriculum around this, well, you we might want to spend some time thinking about how can you actually uh, create experiences where the students understand uh, you know, what the, the models are up to. And then you can do things like look at embeddings and say, well, even though you know cat with a lowercase c and a capital C are totally different tokens, there's this concept of the embedding space. Again, this you know high dimensional vector spaces might seem incredibly abstract and not useful to students until uh, it turns out that they're capturing some semantic content of text. And so you know here uh, you you see that uh, so you have this high dimensional vector space, and you know you you might wonder so what what's some distance metric on this space, and so you can pick one, and so picking more or less at, at uh, you know, an obvious distance metric, but not necessarily one that means too much. We shouldn't read too much into these sorts of things. But, you know, students can immediately see, oh, even though these are different tokens, they're pretty close to each other in this high dimensional space. Whereas other tokens that are, you know, further apart in this space are somehow less similar. Uh, and, you, you know, you can take, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the first couple paragraphs of a bunch of uh, books, and you can find the embeddings that a large language model would give to these and project down and plot them. And 
miraculously, or maybe not miraculously, but sure enough, uh, they they cluster in the way that makes sense to us as a, a reader, right? So all these books came from, or excuse me, all these uh, clusters came from the first chapter of the same book. And so this, this uh, you know, th these ways of exploring what are these technologies up to in a way that sort of connects with students is, I think, a problem that all of us as educators are going to have to solve. So again, some, some suggestions for activities that you can try. Uh, now, you know, you, you could even make it interdisciplinary, right? So uh, you can teach about prompting in a sort of zero shot way where you have some instruction that just says, you know, please only answer with the title of a book, which book contains the following paragraph and you feed it a, a paragraph. And then you, you might say, okay, so let's, even though the embedding vectors were clustering in this nice way, uh, does that mean that the language model automatically knows what books these are in? Well, no, it doesn't, right? Uh, so, but interestingly, you can see that some of the mistakes that the large language model makes are not so different from the ones a student might make, right? So, Again, two authors from the same family, uh, confusing Tolstoy, Tolstoy from Dostoevsky if you're only reading a paragraph of the book. Maybe their styles actually are similar enough that that makes sense, right? So you could actually create a uh, activity for students where you run something like this. And then, you know, as a, another uh, task that then you could give is, let's say, part of an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary course on literature and computation, which I wish there were more of, right? Uh, the, the students could read these two books and then say, all right, well, which parts do I think are the most similar? And then you could feed them into a model to get their embeddings and say, well, which part does the model think are the most similar? And this is now an interesting question that, uh, you know, is it the case that the the embedding sense of what's similar is the same as what the students think are similar? Probably not exactly, right? But that, that's at least an interesting part to uh, actually jump into as part of an activity that one might do. So uh, the other thing that, that students should know something about are, are prompting techniques. So uh, one of the things which uh, emerged as an important concept is this idea of train of thought. So the, the basic premise behind chain of thought is that if the model is providing reasons along the way, it tends to do a better job on a variety of tasks than if it's just given an input and then immediately tells you what it thinks the output is. In other words, having this chain of reasoning uh, in language that the model is producing tends to help. And so there's various ways that you can set this up programmatically, uh, but whenever your students are interacting with a model, this is, this is a concept that they should have in mind, right? Is that if they're just asking it to do something and wanting to know only what an answer is, that actually can negatively impact what the large language model's uh, accuracy is, right? Uh, if the model is actually explaining its process along the way, this can help in many domains. Plus, it's actually really helpful for the student being to being able to understand, did the model make a mistake when they're looking at an output that may not make sense? And so, you know, introducing this concept uh, is one of the key things that students are probably going to want to have some some sense of. So what you can do is you, you can take, again, so this is a, a data set of uh, the, the first part of a much larger data set, which is uh, grade school math, right? So 8,000 grade school math students. And they're, they're of this type, right? And so you can see actually an interesting thing that uh, the newer models, so th when I ran this, this was using, um, let's see, I believe 3.5. Yep, so it's set to 3.5. So if I run this again, uh, it will give us the same sort of chain of thought here. Notice that it's not, uh, it looks like we actually hit a stop token before we uh, we got to the end answer. So that's interesting. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, the first time that we ran it, um, you know, it, it did actually come up with the correct answer. And it, without us asking it to provide a chain of thought, it did. So th this is actually something that in particular domains, um, some of the newer models that OpenAI has out are actually doing anyway, just as part of the way they operate. Is they're they're now tending to give chain of thought a little more often than than what they might have done uh, older models would have. So, uh, as a way of illustrating that, so you you might take like the Da Vinci three model and you might ask it the same question, uh, and, and the uh, zero temperature result anyway is that it doesn't go into a chain of thought. It just provides a sentence that gives an answer. Okay. Now, uh, this chain of thought answer did actually come up with the solution. Again, we didn't tell it to give a chain of thought here. And so uh, we, we had a much stranger thing go on here where it actually looks like it came up with a, a stop token before it even arrived at an answer. Let's run it one more time and, and see 
uh, will this stick with the pattern? Yeah, okay, so here it did give a chain of thought, but it gave the wrong answer, right? So again, this was GPT 3.5, not 4. So let's go ahead and uh, also we can get into, so what is few shot learning in the context of a large language model? So in the context of a large language model, uh, you, you might give some general instruction, you might give some exemplars of what you want the in and outs to be, and then you ask the real question that you actually had. Right. So this was basically what was followed in the original chain of thought uh, paper. It's not necessarily, I should emphasize, the way that your students might utilize this concept. They're probably going to use it in a much more organic way. But still, the, the general uh, feature that, that we want them to, to have some sense of is that if the models have seen examples of the, for the right sorts of things to do and they're talking their way through their process, they tend to have better outputs. So again, we can we can ask GPT-4 uh, to not actually uh, give any chain of thought reasoning, right? So again, you fill out a few shot template. Uh, you could also do this with LLM example function, but I wanted to just be able to show, uh, you know, what what does the template look like in this form? And so, uh, you know, if we're giving the instructions as the context, right, where the the previous exemplars were something where no reasoning was provided we can take GPT-4 and actually drastically reduce its accuracy. Um, so, okay, sure, it got this one right, where the answer happened to be 18, but uh, so th this uh, cloud object, I made the permissions public so that you can you can take a look if you wanna play around with this data. But, uh, you know, if you look at these different things, right? So if you just use this in-out uh, technique where you are asking these newer models to do something, they will generally go into chain of thought on their own in this particular domain. They won't do that in all domains. And so it's, it's a good thing to, to keep students aware of. So if you ask them a question and you don't see the model displaying some behavior like chain of thought, but it was a pretty complicated question, you should maybe worry that that happened, right? And you might, you might encourage the model to actually give you the chain of thought about how it got to its conclusion. Because, uh, you know, if you, give GPT-4 the instructions to not use chain of thought, you only have it provide you with the number, like by using this this uh, few shot prompt, y you can take GPT-4, which is quite good at grade school math when it's using chain of thought. But if you say, no, just give me the number, don't give me a chain of thought, just give me the number, you can make GPT-4 quite bad at things it would ordinarily be good at, right? And so usually the task is going to be, okay, you know, if given something that it's not doing chain of thought, how can I get it to do chain of thought? But just as a quick example of, of how you can see that this really matters, even in some domain that, you know, you, you would think GPT-4 would be able to do, and ordinarily it can. But if you remove that capacity for chain of thought, suddenly it will be quite bad, right? Uh, and again, the, the older models that also didn't do chain of thought also quite bad, right? So uh, again, if you just let them do what they do, right? So this was just in-out prompting, not telling it specifically to use chain of thought. And again, the way you normally do that is, is with some exemplars uh, in, as a preamble to the actual question that you have. But, you know, these newer models, at least in this domain, they'll just kind of go for that anyway, because that's what they do now. Uh, but uh, so then there's this other idea of sampling, right? So uh, we can see here that uh, even using a model, which is you know, in some sense worse, uh, if you're not just taking the most likely thing, but you're sampling from some distribution, there's all sorts of ways to do this, right? But the the key question, again, for how we're going to teach about this is, all right, so it, it turns out that this model is probabilistic. And so if you look at what are the answers it's coming up with to the same question, you can see that it's not too sure about this, this answer, because uh, when it's doing the sampling, it's getting a, a pretty uh, diverse range of values. But if you just take the majority value, so this one came up slightly more often than the other two, that turned out to be correct in this case, right? And so this is what's known as chain of thought with self-consistency and was one of the other prompting techniques that, that um, has come out in the last uh, year, year and a half, right? So at any rate, th there's this, this very rapidly evolving field of prompting techniques. And so the question is, given that students are going to really be using this, what, what do we need to distill down for them that is important? And so one of the things I think is that, you know, chain of thought is important. Um, so 
uh, you know, as, as I've just mentioned, there's a whole bunch of other techniques which are relevant. So uh, there's Tree of Thoughts, and there's a very nice uh, Wolfram Summer School project where someone was looking into how can this be used to solve particular problems, uh, and many, many other things which uh, are proposals and uh, things that have been used to, to get good performance in various domains. And so, you know, time will tell what gets distilled out of this, this area is, into what we then need to really tell you know, let's say a, a middle school student who is wanting to use this to help them solve problems. You know, so in in this particular domain, okay, if their problems are of this sort, well, then the newer models are engaging in this chain of thought behavior anyway. But if it's a more complicated process that the student's wanting to use a large language model for help for, they shouldn't just think that, oh, models always just use chain of thought because sometimes they don't in particular domains. And if you can get them to do it, it will often help their performance. Okay. so. Um, I want to uh, take a minute here. Um, so there's another activity that I can suggest about computational thinking. Um, also plenty of links here that many of you will probably be familiar with, but I do wanna make sure that we get a chance to actually look at these, these Q and A, right? Okay. So um, let's see here. So it looks like, okay. It, it, I don't know whether this is fortunate or unfortunate, but it seems like in, in many ways I might be preaching to the choir here. Um, so in some sense that's good because we're in agreement, but uh, it makes for less to go on in a Q&A. So let's see, what, else, what other sorts of questions have we had here? Um, yeah, actually, so uh, Anton mentions that uh, as for you know ingredients to LLM inter interactions, right? So again, in I didn't show you the code for creating this little data set, right? But you know, a student designing an experiment such as this and then executing on that design, uh, that makes for a great activity. So in other words, if you want to you know, test these things, uh, there's a certain amount of experimental design that, you know, so we have science classes where we're teaching about physical sciences, but you know, you, you could actually have a collaboration between, let's say, your science classroom and your uh, technology or computing or wh whatever it happens to be called in your particular school setting that are, are actually saying, okay, well, we've got this new technology, let's experiment with it. And you can design the experiment and write it up in your science class, and you can do the experiment in this other class. So these are the sorts of collaborations that uh, whenever I had the opportunity to do as an educator, I always uh, tried to implement. Um, as, as many of us probably know, there's there's always complications that come up when doing these sorts of things. Um, let's see. Yeah, ch so ch yeah, ch chain of thought generally. So another thing um, I should mention briefly, so some of the relevant things to put into these uh, these other things that are out there in the literature, right? So one of the things that lets a uh, tree of thoughts often be quite useful just using a large language model, not necessarily even to having to have other classifiers or other evaluators, is that um, in many domains, it seems that a large language model can provide some kind of heuristic about how plausible it thinks a particular chain of reasoning is to work, right? So this, this is kind of the core idea behind tree of thoughts. And so, uh, you know, you, you might teach students about this concept by uh, coming up with some exercise where they have a bunch of examples of reasoning and they have annotated, you know, which ones are going to work and which ones aren't going to work. And that's part of, you know, what they're learning. And then the other thing is that then you can uh, explore this concept and, and test. Okay. So in this domain where you just did the annotation, uh, how, how good is the model at saying, you know, this is a correct answer. This is not a correct answer. Um, so uh, it's, it's another, it's another opportunity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of uh, things that we could teach about, um, there, there's elements from all of these that I, I hope will make their way down into the, because a lot of it comes down to trying to figure out how to get uh, a system like a large language model to engage in something analogous to metacognition, right? And so metacognition, again, th this is one of the implicit skills that um, there is uh, work, I, I forget who to cite here, but uh, you know, pe pe people have looked at, uh, making metacognition an explicit skill that students are engaging with uh, can really help 
how they do in, in various courses. And so, you know, there, there's all these exciting, you know, cutting edge areas where, you know, trying to get a computer to engage in something that approximates metacognition is a way to actually teach students about metacognition, right? Um, so that I think that's an exciting possibility. Um, okay, so let me then, uh, since it uh, looks like, if you have any, you know, areas of great disagreement or areas of, uh, you know, thing, things that worry you about this. Uh, and again, we'll take a look at if you had a chance to do the survey, uh, what other sorts of results that we got. But uh, feel free to put those into our little Q&A here too, uh, here in Big Marker, because I'd be very curious to hear those. But as one other uh, thing, right? So uh, as I've hopefully convinced you uh, that, you know, learning with and about large language models, uh, you know, can engage students' metacognitive skills, which is a good thing, right? So, you know, this is just the latest technology that has, uh, you know, allowed this. Thinking about thinking and, you know, framing your thinking process in terms of problem solving, and especially in terms of computational problem solving, you know, that was something that has been around for way longer than large language models, or even language models in general, uh, right? So, having any sort of tool that can do computation gives you an opportunity for thinking about how can you build this into different activities, right? And I'm, I'm also a, a big fan of trying to bring computation into areas which are not, you know, the usual suspects of mathematics, sciences, uh, like chemistry, physics, biology, right? These are really important places to have computation. But uh, there's, there's other domains like history where they're, they're basically entirely absent from the, uh, the the curriculum, right? The, the most creative use for computation in many history courses you might see is you'll, you'll get a creative instructor who uses a uh, interactive game to teach about some historical event. And that, that might be the most creative that you get, right? Uh, but so here, here's a little sample activity that uh, hopefully will spark uh, others' imagination uh, of the sorts of things that you can uh, you know do in a history classroom. So uh, again, the, the key point is for students to understand that all these things are possible, right? Once they understand that they're possible, they can articulate the strategy. And then once they can articulate the strategy, either they can implement it, or nowadays, if the strategy is something that a model uh, like ChatGPT or one of our chat-enabled notebook models can can do, well, great. Uh, you know, th then they don't they no longer even have to implement the strategy themselves. Uh, they might tweak it here and there if the model doesn't do a good job. But if they can just know that these things are possible and then articulate them as a strategy, you know, that's that's the first step toward uh, integrating computational thinking into other curriculum areas. So, all right, let's say that we take, uh, you know, castles, and I want to get a list of castles in a particular place to to get students started off on this question of, you know, are there patterns of construction in in English castles, and Okay, yeah, it's possible to get such a list. It's possible to get dates of constructions. It's possible to spot some patterns, right? So, uh, you know, you, you see that there seems to be a particular century where this really just took off. It was a phenomena that existed in, in little spurts here and there. And then suddenly something must have happened that all of a sudden this was a thing that people did in England, in what's now England anyway. Uh, and so then the students can investigate further, right? Maybe they want to zoom in here and just refine this by decade. And again, they see a similar thing, right? Where things happened in, in spurts and then there was a particular decade even where things really took off uh, and then some other blips as well. And so they might then refine their question of, okay, well, given that there are these patterns where there's particular decades and years that some historical event must have happened, uh, you know, if you know that it's possible to select and group things by criteria, like, you know, what decade uh, was the construction date, then you can create visualizations that that show these sorts of things, and uh, you know something that might not be obvious to students as an explicit fact, right? So again, especially in education, this difference between implicit versus explicit uh, learning goals. So every student knows that when it's interactive, it's better, but they might not know that as something they can articulate. And so if if you you know uh, engage with that by having them you know, first design this, well, if they can design that, they can also design an interactive explorer too, so that they can visualize, <coughs> excuse me, these patterns in a much more uh, engaging way. And so sure enough, yes, there there are in fact uh, patterns in these in these construction uh, locations uh, if, if you organize them by decade. And now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I need a drink. <clears throat> so now 
you can even ask uh, large language models for, for input into this process, right? Where, you know, you can, as a student, let's imagine, so if you're a history buff, you, you might well know that after the Battle of Hastings, that uh, the, the new ruling class in, in England, uh, you know, went about this, this spree of castle construction as a way of, of uh, asserting their uh, control politically, right? But as a student who just was handed this activity, they might then say, oh, well, I have this AI tool. Let me ask it, uh, you know, what, what happened? And sure enough, it did a pretty good job this time. Let, let's see, is this a ro <coughs> robust piece of knowledge? And, and sure enough, <coughs> in this particular case. But again, it, it's always nice to be able to verify something that a language model is telling you. Uh, whether it's you know a student who's using it as part of their learning, or or whether let's say uh, uh, you know building something in production, uh, having some kind of verifier can be nice. And so you know the the language model asserts that yep there's this particular year, and sure enough if you zoom into that decade where things really started to take off, you see that uh, this was indeed the year that many of these castle constructions were started. Uh, they even uh, are around where it turns out if you look up uh, in Wolfram Alpha. Because uh, again, computation is not just for math and sciences. Uh, if you look up, sure enough, geographically, suddenly everything we've been seeing makes sense, right? If if the student goes back and looks at their explorer, then oh yeah, this is this is a reasonable explanation for why this is happening. And then you can use that as a jumping-off point for let's say maybe your more traditional uh, modes of of engagement with history, right? So you you might say, well, who were these people that that moved around and and got involved in this battle, and what were the human factors that led to this? What are the primary sources that are the reason that we know about any of these things, right? And then uh, you, you can even go back and say, well, great. So we've done all this exploration of this particular event, but you see another blip here. So students, what, what's the event that uh, explains this other blip that you see where this, this phenomena really took off a second time? So again, if a student knows that these things are possible, the uh, implementation then is, is more just a question of when rather than how nowadays, right? Because you, you've got models that can help with code writing. There, there's all sorts of ways. Uh, but just, just knowing that you can articulate this as a strategy is the first step, I think. All righty, so let, let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So, One of the things, yeah, one, okay, one of the things that uh, I, yeah, right, so we have a nice, let me um, put this into the uh, general chat here if I can. So first I think I have to answer and then I can put this, yeah, so let me publish that. Oh, can I not do that? Uh, whoever the admin is, if we can put the, uh, Anton's uh, Q&A into the uh, general, maybe maybe that isn't doable in this version of Big Marker. Anyway, um, so yeah, there, there's a nice uh, example of uh, the sort of workflows with LLM functions in Wolfram language uh, that uh, Anton has a great community post about that uh, is linked here. So uh, do check that out and maybe I'll screen share that just briefly here. Yeah, so uh, this, this community post, right? So uh, th this is uh, one of the ones that, uh, came up in the in the chat here. Uh, let me, all right, let me turn the screen share off for a second, see what else we have. Um, what other things are coming up in Q&A? Yeah, okay, so there's this question of, uh, this This came up actually in our networking session for education professionals. So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the point that, I forget who made it, but I agree with it, whoever made the point. Um, which is that uh, you know when you're you're getting large language models to produce output, and uh, you have not really put much into it as a as a human, right? So I mean, I think in our experiments with them, we sort of know that uh, in in a lot of domains, you you can get them to do what you want, and it's faster, let's say, than if you wrote it yourself sometimes, but. Um, it still is non-trivial work to you know guide the model into doing the right thing, and so if uh, you know as an educator that you, you can tell the difference between what students are giving you, right? So even if, even if you're encouraging these tools to be used in your classroom, I think there will be a qualitative difference uh, in many times that you'll be able to tell where okay this this student probably just did the bare minimum of engaging with the model, and in you know the first thing that it did is the you know sum total of the project. Right. Well, 
that probably is, isn't going to assess as well because then when they're doing their metacognitive reflection on what were their inputs, they're not going to have as much to show as what the actual back and forth was. Whereas a student who who you know did did some iterating of you know not just taking literally the first thing and hopefully again this again it's a matter of education policy as much as it is um, practice is having assessments where the assessment item is something real that that actually does take input in order to produce it. It's not something that you know a computer is just going to do instantly, right? Um, so if, if it's that sort of assessment target and the student is able to uh, you know, actually have this iterative process where they go back and forth and create something, which is really cool. I think that will show, especially if you incorporate this this thing about, okay, so given this is your output, great, but then go back and actually tell me about the process. You know, what what were the false starts that the model had? What, what, what did it keep doing that you didn't want it to do? And how did you get around that? I mean, that's actual learning that the students are doing. It's probably not the exact learning goals that you know, people would have had before this technology even existed. But I think they're perfectly valid learning goals. Like if we believe the premise that this is a tool that is a useful tool, then having the student learn the ways that they can get the most out of it is a good goal. So uh, yeah, that that's, uh, again, much of this conversation is assuming that um, you're, you're in a context where the policy is such that you can actually use these technologies, right? I mean, this, again, education is one of these areas where, um, in fact, there's an ethics professor I once had who pointed out this interesting fact that uh, when you're talking about, you know, ethics in education, education is one of the few, if only areas, perhaps, where the professionals don't set their own policy, right? Uh, at least not to the degree, that's maybe a little bit oversimplification because in, in most domains, there's, you know, other policy considerations besides just the professional society. But in, in many domains, more of the, you know, professional regulation is, is conducted sort of by the professionals, whereas in education, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of layers of policy that, that actually Im influence the, the practice. And so, uh, you know, if, if it is the case that I'm sort of preaching to the choir here about the things that are, are possible and, and uh, exciting new directions, um, this, this policy question is going to be increasingly relevant, right? Because, uh, you know, if, you know, you know, one one instructor invents some great curriculum where they're teaching, uh, you know, physics 101 using a, a large language model, and suddenly it went from uh, I, I kid you not, it was called the Dream Killer course uh, <laughs> uh, in in various places because uh, you know it was a required course for many students that didn't really have a uh, uh, an interest to go beyond it, right? So I I, I was in that major, and so you know, this was a course I enjoyed. But for many students, they, they didn't actually want to take it. They just sort of had to. So this gets into these questions of policy. And so, you know, it had an incredibly high failure rate because of that. And so, uh, you know, if, if let's say that, you know, in one campus, lots of students are actually using uh, large language models and, and they're succeeding on these sorts of courses that are the, the ones that, that are a, a bit of a sore subject sometimes. Well, uh, okay, that's great if they're doing it on some campuses, but then if it's a question of policy that there's other campuses that you're just not allowed to use that, this technology, I, I mean, that, that's kind of outside the realm of just education or just technology, right? These are, these are larger questions that, that uh, are going to come up. All right. So um, as promised real quick as we're wrapping up here, um, let me send off your Q&A uh, to see what sort of other things you expressed as... Uh, concerns, perhaps, uh, and then let me share that. So, okay, yeah, it, look, it looks like, uh, let me, yeah, all right, so it looks like we didn't get too many new ones because people are asking their questions at Big Marker. That's fine. So same, <laughs> same Q&A as before. Um, all right, uh, but yeah, so again, thank you all very much, and uh, again, um, so one of the things that we try to do here for the academic innovation support team is we try to connect with educators who are excited about implementing curriculum visions like the, the one that I was sort of evangelizing. So uh, if, if you know any such educators, please don't hesitate to point them our way. Uh, because uh, again, uh, you know, the, the, this co-design shouldn't just happen between educators and uh, you know, language models, right? The co-design uh, is, Part of what we've talked about in some of the live streams we've had with educators recently is that you know students can be an important part of this co-design as, as well, and so they're they're of course going to have very relevant opinions on how these technologies are impacting their learning, and and so 
uh, you know, have, having that input from them is another piece to the puzzle, right? So I, I can I can certainly give you my perspective with some experience teaching, but uh, I have not actually been in the classroom in the last year since these became, you know, the new thing. So uh, that's that's an important important facet to keep in mind, I think. Okay. So. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know. Can people, if people want to unmute themselves as part of this to, to ask any questions or, or have discussion, uh, that's fine. I don't know if you can in this session. It's far as fine as I'm concerned, though. But uh, that, that might not be possible in this kind of session. Yeah, looks like not in this kind of session. Okay, yep. So uh, again, let me take uh, keep, keep my eye on the Q&A here. Um, Anton, I can indeed see that link, although it is not in uh, Markdown. But yes, I can see it. Yeah, Marco makes a great point here in, in Q and A, uh, which actually, Marco, I should say, uh, if you're you're still in the room, I have definitely repeated uh, to, to various people, which is that uh, you know stu students starting something in data science thinking that oh this is mostly coding when actually uh, the the core skills are mostly not that. Um, it, 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 this is something now that, uh, aside from just questions of assessment, having, uh, you know, people who are, excuse me, ha having students who are coming in and uh, thinking that there is a, uh, you know, a, a different skill set that's important to learn just because historically it was the harder thing or it was emphasized in assessment, right, um, compared to what the actual thing is. I mean, th this is uh, one of the things that I find quite, quite ironic about this whole area is that uh, you know, basically educators uh, ha have been writing about how our assessments aren't aligned with what we want students to be learning for at least five decades, right? I mean, it, it, it goes back further than that. You can find examples of pe people writing about that, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, but uh, even in the age of doing slightly more systematic studies of these sorts of things, uh, you know, decades and decades and decades, this, is, this has been an issue. So I, I think we have a good excuse here to revisit this question about uh, assessment and you know what what is it that we actually want students to be able to produce after taking a course or after getting a degree let's say all right so um, as far as this session if we don't have any other q and a I think that let me check that one more time yeah yeah no so uh, Marco says that uh, it is ironic that that this has been something that people have been writing out for a long time, but yeah. So yeah, if uh, that looks like the the end of our questions, pretty much. So if people want to put any more in there, I'll be sticking around for at least a little bit longer. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's essentially the session. When using code writing assistant, okay, what things should a person look for to improve the style of code produced by the LLM? Great question. So uh, one thing that I've noticed is that the uh, OpenAI models tend to write code in a very procedural style, and it's basically hopeless to break them of that. Um, I mean, uh, my my uh, my best attempt might be to create some prompt that has a couple exemplars of what what things look like at a functional compared to procedural style. Um, that actually might work. I haven't tried it. Uh, but you know, in terms of like a student or, or like a low amount of, of work uh, needed to, to use the code assistant, um, I think it, it very much has a bias toward writing in a procedural style of programming. Because you know, if, if you look at programming languages, most of the code that's written is in a procedural style, right? And so. Um, it seems to have picked up on on those habits, so that that that's one thing to note is that just stylistically, um, many th many times it will do things procedurally rather than um, doing them in a more functional style. Uh, the other thing that you should be on the lookout for uh, is that it it might use uh, camel case, or excuse me, might use a snake case, right? So of course, uh, snake case for it. And just to show what I mean, uh, let me pull up the notebook here and start typing. But uh, so if you write some variable like this, right? So this is uh, going to be a pattern in Wolfram language, right? And so 
uh, in other languages that don't have patterns, snake case might be a perfectly good case to name variables variables in. And so it does a pretty good job of not doing that if, if it knows that it's supposed to be writing Wolfram language, but that, that is a, a common thing that, that will happen, right? Is that it, it will sneak in some snake case variable. And unfortunately, a common thing that it will do that. So let, let's say that you have, um, um, let's say that you have this, let me put in a, a chat blocker here just to illustrate this. Oops. Um, uh, I don't know. Let me just do something trivial here just to illustrate the point that I mean. So if I say, um, please set this variable equal to three instead of five, let's see if it will, yeah, see, it, it loves to do this. If it's seeing a subscript, it loves to turn it into snake case. And so if you're not aware that that's a, it's a tendency that it has, um, especially if you're using this with students who might not understand that, that why that's a concern, um, you know, just be aware. It, it loves to do that. It, it will see uh, subscripts and it will, I think probably because it, it knows uh, the, the uh, syntax of uh, uh, LaTeX, right? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where it got that from. Um, but at any rate, when it, when it sees these sorts of things, um, it, it loves to do that. And so you, you it, it would be cumbersome to say, you know, ne never, you know, ne pending to every prompt, right? Um, but again, th these, these are the sorts of things to watch out for. Um, what other kinds of things does it like to do? Um, sometimes it doesn't know the, uh, the arguments that are expected for various functions, right? So, or if it does know them, because I mean, if it can do it right, at least once in some sense it knows them, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have a robust to prompting uh, knowledge of the exact arguments for every function, right? And so, so sometimes it will do things that, okay, that's a, that's a plausible way that you could try to use a function named that, but it's not the way that this function works. So um, again, your question specifically was, uh, what should you look for to improve the style? Um, I don't necessarily have. Uh, I mean, okay. So one one thing you can do. So if you're if you're curious about what, um, so let's say uh, William playwright. Right? If you're if you're curious what these various personas do. Um, oh, that's interesting. Did I spell it wrong? I did. Uh, so if you're curious about what these uh, various personas, you know, are, are created with via prompting, um, you can look at them, right? You can just say LLM prompt name of name of prompt. And so, uh, you know, if for your particular use case, let's say that you're teaching a course where there's subscripts everywhere, right? Y you might want to make some custom prompt that then, uh, you know, the student isn't having to manually append all these sorts of things in there. Uh, but then, you know, as part of the process of sending the user instruction off, this gets appended just like, so just to show you how that works. Uh, so let's uh, talk to William Playwright and say, um, uh, I don't know, write me a poem about, subs or let's not even give him the instruction to write the poem. Let's just say, tell me about subscripts. And let's see if we'll get this in the William Playwright style, who's the Elizabethan. Yeah. So again, um, one one thing you might do is if you're in a particular context where you know the, the sorts of things that uh, you know the, the large language models love to do are just coming up all the time for you, you you might consider you know writing a custom prompt that then people can just append like that that then can go in the prompt repository and then you, you won't have to worry about this sort of thing um, at least not as much. Um, there there are certain things that you know even if you tell it you know, uh, don't do this, do that. It, it, certain things are just so ingrained into the base training that uh, it, even if you tell it, it doesn't always listen to you. Uh, another interesting example of that is uh, um, if you give it a tool, right? So uh, I, I left the example out of this presentation, but but it's in the uh, the Wolfram U webinar that we did on this, this topic, right? Is that if you give it a tool um, and you know, don't do anything else, letting it know that it has a tool. 
uh, it will sometimes still not call it if the tool lets it call, uh, you know, up to date information because, you know, it, you ask it about some new thing, even if you gave it a Wikipedia searching tool, let's say, and, you know, as part of its base training, it thinks that, oh, I've been asked about up to date information. Let me say that I don't know how to do that because I'm a large language model, even when you've given it a tool, right? So it, it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial amount of work to break those sort of very deeply ingrained habits of the, the bare models, which is why something like ChatGPT, let's say, has other things on top of the, the bare large language model. So if you're you know, making a tool that then you're going to give to a large language model, um, you know, th these are sorts of things. So let, let's see, any other Q&A questions that we have coming in? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, that's right. So when, when you're displaying uh, different things like subscripts uh, in, you know, let's say online or, you know, the notation in, in some other common thing like, like LaTeX. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't know the exact reason, but uh, there's, there's plausible reasons why this is a very common thing that it, that it tends to goof up. Um, and, and let's do my, my highly scientific experiment here and see if it'll even do it twice. Yep. So, <laughs> happened twice must be the pattern. All right, so we we have lots of attendees still here, which is great. Um, please please put things in. Uh, how does it know when to call the the Wolfram plugin? Ah, so uh, Michael Trot gave gave a, a primer on the Wolfram plugin uh, as one of the talks. So if you didn't catch that one, catch that one because that will be able to answer your question much better than I can. Um, there's like I said, it it's. It's more complicated than just giving, uh, you know, a, a bare large language model a tool. So what can you do as a student ah, to encourage teachers in your institution or classroom to have a computational approach to topics? That is a great question. Uh, if I could ask, uh, if you could put in the Q&A um, just a follow up of, of what level of institution are you talking at? Because I think that the answer is a little bit different in different institutions. So. If you're talking about uh, institutions at like the university level, I think professors are mostly just limited by what time they have to implement stuff. They're they're generally barring some other larger institutional constraint. Like let's say there there are some campuses that have just said, yeah, I'd like no one can use ChatGPT for classes, right? Um, barring that, um, professors I think are are usually pretty open to suggestions along this line. Um, and so, you know, just, just being approached by some enthusiastic students, right? I mean, let, let's say even that uh, there's a group of students who are interested to have another nice project that they've worked on over, you know, winter term or summer or something. And, and you know, you approach a professor and say, you know, I really wish this class had more computation in it. Um, do you want a student assistant to help you build that? I mean, that, that's something that, you know, we definitely want to encourage people to do. Um, we have, uh, I've linked at the bottom here, we've got student ambassador programs and emerging leaders programs uh, where these are some of the things that, that you know, you might want to do as, as part of those things. But uh, yeah, no, so I think, I think at the university level, um, you know, just having the conversation with professors of being like, oh, I think this would be a neat thing. And then especially if you can sort of sweeten the deal by saying, you know, you don't, you don't have to spend your time on it. You know, let's get me as a student assistant to, to help with that. Um, I think that's a, that's a good approach to try. Um, I think at the, the pre-college institutional level, this is a much more complicated question because, uh, again, having the appropriate background knowledge is a really key part of learning. And so if you're talking about a brand new technology where many pieces of uh, you know general curriculum have not even told the story of how we got here so so you're you're playing catch up from the beginning um, the the teachers themselves will need a certain amount of training before they'll feel like they can most effectively use these sorts of things in their classroom um, there is actually literature where uh, teachers are particularly uh, skittish sometimes understandably uh, at the uh, the pre-college level in using things in their classroom that they don't understand well, right? So in other words, they, they feel like they need a certain level of understanding of the topic before they're you know willing to jump in with their students, right? And so how do you get teachers that with a brand new piece of technology? That's a complicated question. Um, again, I think a pol policy is part of it, um, where you know if, if 
trainings on particular pieces of technology are encouraged, then you know that's part of the puzzle. Um, also, at the pre-college level, uh, one of the things that can be a big challenge are assessments. This was also brought up as as part of the uh, edu- uh, what was it called uh, uh, education professionals networking session, where you know. A, a, a big reason, which is a good reason to keep in mind that many things are done is because, well, you know, there's a big state assessment and this state assessment plays a pretty big role in deciding, you know, where students are going to land for college and they care about that. Right. Uh, so g- given that um, you have a couple options. One is there are schools that care less about that just be, uh, I mean, schools at the pre-college level that care less about those assessments just because they're sort of, you know, hanging up their their sign on the door that, yeah, we, we do a slightly different thing. Um, they tend not to be public schools, unfortunately, um, but they are out there. Uh, so that that's that's one one thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, another thing is that uh, I have heard um through, through the grapevine that uh, various people in university admissions don't really care about those sort of big standardized things as much as everyone seems to think that they do. Uh, like, yeah, it's a metric that they need a bottom line for a- at some level, but there's other things that that they care about too, right? And so uh, it, it, it's interesting. It's hard to convince sometimes students, but especially their parents of that fact, right? And so when it, when it comes to like, yeah, you know, for, forget the big standardized test where I don't have a calculator. I'm going to learn to use math using a computer. Um, I mean, if everyone thinks that that you need that standardized test and that, you know, if you somehow learn math using a computer, that's going to hurt you on the test, well, people won't adopt it. But if you instead, um, you know, are able to convince people that, yeah, okay, that, that test, they don't care about it as much as you think they do anyway. Plus, you know, if you're actually motivated to learn the stuff, you know, doing it with a pen and paper is possible, right? But you you can you can do much more than that, much much more applied problems. Um, you know, uh, not only being constrained to that. Yeah. Okay. So the, yeah. So uh, the the question specifically was related to the the pre college uh, pre college institution. So yeah, um, it's a tough one. I mean, to be perfectly frank, that's one reason why I'm not in the classroom at the moment is because. Uh, there are a lot of inertia in in pre college education. I was I was very fortunate that I got to teach in some places where uh, that was as minimally felt as it, I think it could have been. Um, but yeah, no, I, I also you know student teaching in in a in a public district, um, you know, I, I suspect they're not going to immediately roll Chat GPT. Uh, into their science curricula, right? Some some might, uh, but but you know they're going to get pushed back at various places uh, for sure. So yeah, that, that's I don't have all the answers there, unfortunately. I, I think uh, I, I think getting people to see you know the sorts of interesting things you can do if you let these things in. Because again, uh, another point I should make is that so uh if i excuse my rapid scrolling here but if we go all the way back to um this this uh advice about assessment that i basically uh skimmed through right so things like project based assessment uh and making sure that uh you know you have clear assessment criteria especially ones that can be like skills based assessment criteria rather than uh you know what percentage accuracy did you get on some recall task uh you know, th- those sorts of techniques are things which are already being popularized and evangelized in education circles. And so if you can convincingly make the case that, you know, tools like large language models are a part of that push that's already happening, I think that makes the conversation easier. Um, and I, I gen- genuinely, they, they do point you in that way, right? Because if your assessment is some recall task of grade school math and someone's using GPT-4 on it, well, uh, you know, GPT-4 is pretty good at that. So you're, you're as, as an assessor, you're going to have to, you know, so to speak, up your game in terms of, you know, what, what you're actually assessing. If you're just saying, okay, figure out this, this problem, and yeah, you had to reason, but you just, you know, spit out a number at the end. Well, okay, a computer can do that, 
uh, with with decently high accuracy now. So, uh, you know, what what else am I actually assessing? Ah, yes. Okay. So, uh, Satiris. Uh, yep. So, if you take a look there um, in the link that Satiris shared, you can actually read the manifest to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, plugin. And so, ba the way that any any plugin works is that there's going to have to be some uh, text that explains to the model what, you know, what what the plugin is good for. Uh, if if you look at, uh, let me reshare here. Um, clicking a bunch of buttons. Yeah, so if you go and you look at uh, Wolfram LLM tool, uh, so, right, you'll notice that one of the things that you can provide as an argument to LLM tool is a description of the tool, right? So a plugin has a larger version of a description that you might write for an LLM tool. And, uh, you know, you, you will notice that on the small scale, when you're providing some, you know, very specific purpose tool, uh, it might actually not even need the the extra description. If you write code, which it can sort of understand what the parameters are for, you don't always need a description. But the, the, the reason why there's the ability to give a description is that if you tell the language model, this is somewhat related to that chain of thought concept we were talking about before, right? Is if, if you provide as part of the prompt to the model, by the way, you have a tool that does this, and then you say, answer some relevant question that is in the, the same ballpark as what this tool that you have does. Well, it will use that context and it might say, oh, I can actually use this as part of the um, part of the problem solving process, right? So in other, you, you write a tool call and then the tool does its thing. And then the output of the tool is provided back to the large language model and the large language model will decide how to incorporate that into uh, more output. But uh, yeah, no, th there's uh, there's definitely other sessions um, by some of the people who actually wrote the the manifest that uh, I encourage you to check out either recordings or or because uh, I think most of them were yesterday. But um, my my knowledge of the schedule is not perfect. All right, we we still have tons of people who are interested. That's great. What what other sorts of uh, questions do we have? Let me real quickly, uh, let's see if anyone has actually done that uh, that survey thing yet. Uh, let me see here. Did we get any new ones? Ah, yeah, okay. So a couple of people have actually done the, uh, the survey now. So, um, yeah, one one person is concerned about uh, access, right? So uh, this is something that I actually am a bit concerned about, right? So um, if I go back to my um, presentation notebook here, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So you'll you'll notice in this little um, uh, where did I put it? Uh, yeah, okay, so in, in the data for this little experiment, right? So if you wanna look at this data set where, you know, I just took 10, 10 of these questions uh, from this grade school math data set uh, and, you know, put, this is a public cloud object so that you can use this data set. You, you don't have to rerun on, I mean, if you wanna do the experiment at scale, you would obviously, but, you know, how many of these examples are used is simply a matter of deciding what, what number to put uh, you know, in, in a particular place in the code, right? This is, if you can do this with 10, it's just as easy to do it with, with uh, 100 or 1,000, you know, given enough uh, computation time and uh, if it involves a cost to cost, right? But uh, yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, I, I chose 10 on purpose, right? Because it, it conveyed the idea without need, because I mean, this, this experiment, has basically been done before, right? In the in the paper that <laughs> describes uh, the the you know chain of thought with self consistency and chain of thought uh, idea in the first place, right? So you know uh, for for purposes of, of this or for you know teaching in a classroom, um, do you want to you know run the thousand examples when ten will do? So I mean I think in terms of access and in terms of cost, um, I think there there is definitely room for people to be very intentional about the way that they use these things, right? So like, uh, 
you know, and you'll you'll also notice that for for most of the things that I I was showing you here, um, you know, 3.5 is perfectly good. Didn't didn't need to use four uh, to. In fact, actually, let let's switch to let let's see if we still get this um, this error here if we switch to four and we uh, see if four equally likes using. Uh, yeah, so four actually likes to use the same problem as well. But uh, at any rate, um, you know, for many things, uh, three with a little bit of extra prompting um, is is not much worse than than four. Um, at least, uh, yeah, that, that's a bit of a broad statement. I, I shouldn't overgeneralize that. But at any rate, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, for many things that are going to come up, especially in pre-college education, um, you you may want to be very intentional about uh, you know what models are you using, uh, and then also when you're designing things. Yeah, no, I think these questions about access. I, I'm not totally sure if we're going to live in a future where um, you know many of these open source models are uh, you know things that that are a regular part of school curricular. If we're going to live in a future where everyone's subscribing to a paid model, I, I'm not sure personally. Uh, we'll find out. Um, so let's see. So I'm doing some training for teachers. Um, great. Yes. So uh, yeah, please, please, uh, Marco. Um, let, I'd love to hear about the the trainings that you're planning to do for uh, you know teachers at the primary and secondary level because uh, there, there's a real need for that. I think internationally, right? So um, yes, that's fantastic to hear that you're doing that. Okay. Well, I think uh, we should probably let people get to other sessions here because I think the, the Q&A has slowed way down. But thank you all so much for stopping in. Uh, it's been really great uh, chatting with you all about education and uh, figuring out, you know, how, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the things that, that we might think about when we're putting uh, large language models into the classroom, either as tools that we're using or as something that we're actually trying to teach about.